Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Good. It's great to have you with us. Uh, great to have you joining us if you're uh, with us on Facebook Live. Uh, we are in week number four of a series that we're moving through called This Is Us. What we're doing is we're looking at several different characters in the Old Testament, and it's going to take us all the way up to the person of Jesus on Easter, where we're going to celebrate and, and um, Resurrection Sunday together. And we're looking at how each person in the Old Testament pointed to the person of Jesus with their life. And then we're asking the question, where do we see ourselves in their story? And how does God want to do that in our lives as well? And so today for our character, Esther, what we have to do is we have to go back in a time in Israel's history when the nation of Israel had been exiled for, to the land of Babylon, throughout the Babylonian and Persian empire. And so by the time of Esther, about a hundred years before Esther's lifetime happened, Israel had literally been taken into exile. They'd lost the temple, they'd lost Jerusalem, they'd lost the Holy Land, and they were scattered throughout this empire. And it was the Persians who were in charge by the time of Esther's life. And even though by the time of Esther's life, the Jews had been given permission to return to the Holy Land, they'd been retur they were returning to Jerusalem, there was a large group of Jews who had decided not to return and go back because they didn't want to go back to a war-torn Jerusalem. And so they decided to stay put right where they were. So Esther is one of those people. She's part of this group of people. Uh, she herself, she lives in the, uh, the capital city of Susa, which was the capital of the Persian Empire. And she's living in a time when, let's just say, women had very little status. In this particular time, in this particular empire, the Persian Empire, you're going to see that as the story unfolds. Women had very little value, very little voice or stature in this society. In fact, Esther isn't even her real name. Uh, she was named for the, the Persian god Ishtar, so that Esther is her uh, Persian name, but her Jewish name, her real name was Hadassah, which means myrtle tree. And the reason we know her as Esther is because she waited and did not reveal her true identity as a Jew until the right moment in the story. Another thing about Esther's story that people find very interesting is the fact that Esther is the only book of the Bible that does not mention the name of God directly. Which makes you think, well, wait a minute, isn't the Bible about God? Isn't that like the whole point? It's supposed to be about God. So why does, is there this book of the Bible that doesn't even mention the name of God directly? So much that some people have even questioned, why does it belong? Why do we even have it included in scripture if it doesn't mention the name of God? And the reason for that is because even though God is invisible in the story of Esther, he is not absent. He is at work in the situations, in the events that happen in her life and in her story. Much like oftentimes he feels like he is in our world. Maybe he appears to be invisible in your life, but he's not absent. He's at work. He's orchestrating events and things that are happening in your life. And so we see the hand of God and the way God is at work in Esther's story, even though he's not mentioned directly by name. And so this is how the story of Esther goes. Here's how the narrative begins. The entire book of Esther begins, Esther chapter one opens, King Xerxes, the king of the Persian empire, has just built himself a beautiful new winter palace in his capital city of Susa. And so what he decides is, hey, I've got this beautiful new winter palace. What I need to do is I need to invite some prominent people in the city together and we need to have a huge feast. And so he invites together all these prominent male guests, people of importance in the city, and they just get hammered drunk. And the, this feast goes on for a few days. And at the height of the feast, when he and all his guests are just absolutely plastered, Xerxes says, I'm gonna, I know what I can do. I'm gonna treat my male guests to a little treat, a little surprise. And so he demands that his beautiful wife, Vashti is her name, his queen. He says, I, I, I would love for you to come and appear before the men. Uh, Esther 1 verse 11 says, wearing your crown. A better understanding of that would be to say, wearing only your crown. If that gives you a picture of what's happening here. So he's saying, I want you to come and I want you to appear completely naked in front of all my, my male guests while we're completely drunk. And Queen Vashti refuses. Thank you, next. <laughs> She's not interested in this at all. 
And so King Xerxes gets so angry, so offended that, there, that she decides not to do this, that he has her deposed immediately. You're not the queen anymore. And, he, and it's kind of this ridiculous play. He sends out this letter throughout the whole land telling men that they need to really get their women in line. You know, it's this sort of ridiculous thing. And, and so he deposes her. She's no longer queen. And so now there's this opening in the empire. They need a queen. So King Xerxes is looking for the next queen. And so that's where Esther enters our story. What's decided is that there's going to be this royal beauty contest. And this royal beauty contest is going to be held throughout the whole land to search for the most beautiful woman. And whoever wins this beauty contest is going to be King Xerxes' next wife. Now, here's the thing uh, about this story. Whenever I have heard the story of Esther told, and maybe you've heard it before, whenever, whenever I've heard it talked about, what we do is we sort of romanticize this royal beauty contest. We treat it almost like it's an episode of The Bachelor or, you know, America's Next Top Model. We're like, oh, I hope she gets the rose. That'd be so great. I hope it's her. We, we, we like love, we romanticize this whole idea. But the reality is, if you really study into what was happening here in this story, this beauty contest is this really brutal, harsh reality that these young women went through. So what I'm about to do is I'm about to destroy the VeggieTales version of Esther. If you grew up hearing that and, and we're, you said, I just, I laugh with glee that you're like, oh, yes. So here's, here's what was really happening. Esther at this time, living in Susa, she was an orphan. And she was being raised by her older cousin, Mordecai. And so what happens is uh, Esther 2 verse 8 says that Esther was taken to be a part of this beauty contest. So this was not her choice. She didn't sign up for it. She was taken and forced to be a part of it against her will. And Esther would have been about 14, 15 years old at this time. And she would have been a virgin. That was the requirements. That's what they were looking for. 14 to 15 year old girls who were virgins, who were beautiful to be a part of this beauty contest. And so she's taken against her will with all these other young women, and here's the way it worked. They were given, each girl was given a series of beauty treatments, whatever that means. And then one by one, each girl would go and would spend a night with King Xerxes. And so as essentially, each girl would be raped, her virginity would be taken, and then after this experience, they would immediately become one of the king's concubines for life. Now, a concubine essentially is a sex slave who has no wife status. So, in fact, uh, the concubines lived in these separate living quarters right there in the palace. And so, they were the king's property for the rest of their lives. So, any idea that, like, after this whole thing was over, even if I don't get chosen to be the queen, I get to go on and get married someday and have this life of my own, that doesn't happen. You, you now are the kings, you go and you live in this separate living quarters and basically whenever the king wants you or whenever the king maybe has a male guest over and he wants to offer you, hey, go in there to, the, to the, where the concubines are and pick one for the night, that's your life. So Esther experiences this. As a 14, 15 year old girl, she goes through this experience and then, of all the girls that King Xerxes raped, he liked raping Esther the best. Yay, she wins the beauty contest. And she gets to be the queen. So, so here's the question. If you are Esther, is this what you'd been dreaming of? No. This is, I, I doubt very much that this was the life that Esther had dreamed of from the time she was a little girl that she was going to get to experience. We think of it as like, wow, she like made it. She arrived. No, she suffered. She went through this unbelievably difficult experience and she became the queen. At the same time, Mordecai, her cousin, is also promoted into the royal court. And so both of our characters become people who have an, in, an influential position in King Xerxes' court. And that's where Esther's story finds itself. And that's where she finds herself it is as the queen living in this place. And that's where enter the villain of the story. His name is Haman. Now Haman, uh, we're told right away, is a descendant of King Agag. Aren't you glad that you know that? So the text literally tells us, I just want you to know Haman, he's a descendant of King Agag. Now why was that important? Why did the text need us to know that? The reason is because King Agag, generations before, was the king of the Amalekites. Now, the Israelites, the Jewish people, and the Amalekites have this long history of, of wars and fighting between each other. And so, Haman, the descendant of King Agag, he hates the Jews. 
I mean, hates the, the Jewish people. And he hates specifically Mordecai, who is, uh, you know, Esther's cousin, who has helped her raise her. And so what he does, because he holds this position of being second in command in the whole kingdom, he goes to King Xerxes and he says, Xerxes, you've got a problem. So here, here's the deal. There's this entire group of people in your kingdom who are worshiping another God than you worship, and they have their own set of laws and their own set of rules that they live by. And so we, we've got to destroy them. We've got to round them up, put them in some ghettos, and we've got to systematically destroy every single one of these Jewish people. And King Xerxes says, great, sounds awesome. And if Haman, I, I want to put you in charge of that. So literally, he puts Haman in charge of this Holocaust, of rounding up all, the, all these Jewish people and executing them and putting them to death. And that's where Esther and Mordecai's story really begins. Now, here's the thing. We're not living today in Susa, in the capital of the Persian Empire, nor are we living in Nazi Germany in the 1940s. But yet, we ask questions today, don't we? We, we ask questions uh, like, when does life start for a human being? That's a debate in our world right now. Another question we ask, how does race impact our opportunities in life? Does everybody basically have the same opportunities? If you're just willing to work hard enough, or does the color of your skin actually impact the doors that are open and the doors that are closed to you? Uh, and another question we ask, can the gay community and the Christian community coexist? See, actually, these are not political questions. These are actually human questions. The only, the only reason they become political questions is because they deal with systems of power in our world that get to decide what's allowed and what's not allowed in our land. But, but really, no matter how much you try to hide behind politics, as followers of Jesus, at some level, we have to engage these questions at a human level. And a human level is where any kind of real change takes place. Laws and things can be written to change people's behavior, but real honest change happens at the human level. And really, that's what Esther's story is about. The, the role that Esther plays, what Esther does is she basically makes King Xerxes, the king of the Persians, he, she makes him deal with this whole execution of the Jewish people, this genocide at a human level. He, she makes him deal with this at a personal human level and that's the impact of her story and that's the power of what she does. And so this is basically the way it takes place. The way it happens is Haman's plan is coming together. He's rounding in the, the, up the Jews. He's putting them in ghettos. He's getting things ready. And he has a special plan uh, for Mordecai. Oh man, he, he has a special execution for him. And so what he does is he builds, a, the text says a gallows, 75 feet tall. Basically, this was a giant impaling pole is what he's building. 75 feet tall impa impaling pole. The reason it needs to be that tall is because when he impales Mordecai on it, he wants everybody in the city to be able to see see Mordecai's body on that pole. He wants everyone to see that and everyone to know I won, I defeated him. And so he's building this pole, it's all coming together and Mordecai is watching this and he's realizing the direction things are going here and he's realizing, oh man, this is not good. And so Mordecai plays the only card really he has to play in this situation. He goes to his cousin, Queen Esther, and he begs her, he says, listen, you've got to do something. You need to step into the situation. You're, a you're the only one who probably can. You're in the position to step in. You've got to go before the king and you've got to ask him to change this decree to kill all the Jews. You've got to do this, Esther. No one else is going to do it except for you. So what I want to do is I just want to listen in on their conversation a little bit. So um, basically Mordecai has just asked Esther to use her position of privilege to go before King Xerxes on behalf of her people. And she responds, all the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. I mean, after all, he had all these concubines, right? So, so she hasn't been called for 30 days. What we don't understand is that even at this, at this time, no one could just walk in and appear before the king in his inner court unannounced, even his own wife. So Esther recognizes what I'm being asked to do here in this moment is literally to put my life on the line, to risk my own life 
To go before the king meant you could literally be put to death. And so uh, Mordecai responds, verse 13. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you are in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply back to Mordecai, go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. I highlighted the words fast for me because this is the closest the entire book of Esther comes to actually mentioning God or mentioning a moment where people turn to God. So when Esther says, go fast for me, what, what's she doing? We uh, took 40 days last fall and we fasted as a church. When you're fasting, what you're doing is you're denying your, your flesh something, in this case, food and drink, in, in order to, to press into God and to pray and to seek him and to ask for his power to come at work in your life. You're, you're denying your power and, and the flesh and you're seeking God. And that's what she's doing. She's asking uh, all the Jews to fast and seek God for her. And she says, do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. And if I must die, I must die. So she comes to this place where she realizes whether I die or not, I've been put in this position for such a time as this and I'm gonna step into this situation. I'm gonna move forward and I'm gonna allow my voice to be heard. What's so powerful about this passage is that up to this point in the story, Esther has had no voice. She's had no choices. Literally, she's not been a character that's made any choices. She didn't choose to be part of the beauty contest. She didn't choose to become queen. She didn't choose any of that. But all of a sudden in this moment, suddenly she has a choice. And it's the ultimate choice she's being given. Will you risk your life? Will you put your life on the line to step between, to be an intercessor between your people and King Xerxes who has the power to, to change this decree and this law? And she decides to do it. She decides to fast and pray for three days and three nights and then she decides to go forward with the plan and so she goes before King Xerxes and in this kind of dramatic moment, this unexpected change that happens when she goes before King Xerxes, not only does he extend his golden scepter to her, but he says, Queen Esther, my, my beautiful queen, come, please come in, I've missed you so much, I will give you anything you ask for up to half my kingdom which is kind of this ridiculous moment because if you know like what the character of King Xerxes has been up to this point in the story. So obviously God had already kind of gone before her and answered her fasting and her prayer and had softened the king's heart. And he says, whatever you want, anything, anything, up to, ask to anything up to half of my kingdom. And she says, okay, here's what I want. Uh, I just want to have a banquet. Let's have another banquet and let's invite Haman, your second in command to come and join us at a banquet. And Xerxes is like, really, that's all you want? Okay, if that's all you want. So they, they put together this banquet and they're gonna invite Haman in. And remember up to this point, no one knows. She's Esther, she's not Hadassah. Nobody knows that she's Jewish. Her identity is still a secret. And so Haman comes for this banquet, this feast, and he's riding high. He's thinking to himself, man, I have arrived. I have made it. I'm being invited in to eat dinner with King Xerxes and Queen Esther. I am a big deal and so he walks in for this queen, with the queen right there for this feast. And at the height of this feast, at this climactic moment, this shift that happens in the entire book, she reveals her true identity as a Jew. And she says, Haman's plot is not only gonna kill all the Jews, it's gonna kill me too. And in this moment, Xerxes is knocked off his chair because suddenly he has to deal with this holocaust, this extermination of the Jews at a human level. Suddenly this became real and personal. And wait a minute, you mean, you mean this is gonna take my wife? This person who, who I love? And suddenly it becomes human, it becomes real. And in this dramatic reversal, he becomes enraged. And Haman pleads for his life. But in this reversal, this gallows that's been built, this 75 foot tall impaling pole that had been built for Mordecai, King Xerxes demands that Haman be sent out and be impaled on that pole so everyone will see Haman, not Mordecai, impaled. And in this dramatic reversal, he changes and stops the decree and, and creates a reversal for the Jewish people. 
so that they, uh, so that the degree is stopped and the Jewish people are rescued and saved because of what Esther did. And the story ends with them instituting another feast. This, this whole book is just about feasts and feasts. There's another piece, feast that they put together called the Feast of Purim. This past week, Wednesday and Thursday, Jews all over the world celebrated the Feast of Purim. It's a, it's a celebration of the story of Esther. Jesus in his day would have celebrated the Feast of Purim as well because the Jews were rescued and they're saved. That's the story of Esther. So if we could take a moment and just say, okay, so let's point that story at ourselves and, and then ask the question, so what does that say to us? What does it have to do with me today? And I would love to just make a statement as we think about that. You can write this down if you want. God allows us, each and every one of us, to be put in positions of privilege for his purposes. God allows each one of us to be put in positions of privileges, of privilege and influence for his purposes. What this means is that you are a steward. That's what you are. Every single one of us have been given something to steward. If you're a parent here this morning, those kids are not yours. Are you kidding me? You have been given a position of privilege and influence in their lives for such a time as this. And I'm here to tell you, it eventually will come to an end. If you're in charge of anything at work or in school or whatever, you're not a boss. That's not what you are. You have been given a position of privilege in your life for such a time of, of, as this to be able to influence other people for God's purposes. That's what you've been given. And what are God's purposes? The purposes of God are always to point to the person of Jesus because he's the greatest hope that we have. And he is the, the greatest hope that the world so desperately needs around us. We're, we're allowed to be put in positions of privilege. Maybe you don't think of yourself as, hey, I, I won this contest and I'm in this important position. Maybe you've gotten there by suffering. Maybe you've gotten there through a really dark, difficult road, but every single one of us is in a position. We've been given something to steward and we are there for such a time as this so God can use our voice because we have choices that we can make, every one of us, to step in and steward what God's given us for such a time as this. Esther as a person, points to Jesus. Her life points to Jesus. In fact, the only reason that the book of Esther is in the Bible, when it doesn't mention the name of God directly, is because of the way the story of Esther foretells the story of Jesus and points to the larger rescue that came through Jesus. I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, Esther points toward Jesus. Esther stayed the hand of Haman, but Jesus completely defeated our ultimate adversary, the one who speaks against us in every moment. Next one. Esther risked her life to save the Jews. Jesus gave his life to save the world. For God so loved the entire world that he gave his son. And Jesus didn't just risk his life, he sacrificed it. Next. Esther risked her position of earthly privilege. Jesus intentionally gave up his heavenly one. Philippians 2 says that Jesus didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped or held a hold of, but he gave that up and took on the nature of a human being and offered his life on the cross. He gave up a heavenly throne. Esther allowed herself to be numbered with her people. Jesus allowed himself to be numbered with sinners and die for them. Next one. One of my favorites in the story, the stake. Remember the 75 foot tall impaling pole? The stake appears to be defeat for Mordecai. Everybody knows he's gonna be impaled on that. But it ended up being victory for the Jews. Haman is the one who's ultimately impaled on it. In the same way, the cross appeared to be defeat for Jesus, but it was victory. The cross was actually victory for us all. And one that occurred to me as I, as I was thinking about this, even just last service that isn't up here on this, is that it's amazing to me that uh, there was a fasting period of seeking God for three days and three nights, and then Esther goes and reveals her true identity, just like Jesus is in the grave three days and three nights after the cross, and then his true identity as the resurrected one, the savior of the world is revealed. And that's the point of Esther's story is it points to the person of Jesus. The, the writer Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 53, talking about Jesus. He said, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. 
He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Verse 12, he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. Just like Esther was an intercessor, Jesus made intercessor for every single one of us, for, for all the transgressors in our world. That's how Jesus used his position of privilege and influence. That's what Jesus did with his position that God allowed him to have. Through suffering, through brokenness, God lifted him up to the highest place and gave him the position that was above everything else. And that's what he did with it. So the only question to, to, that remains then for us to ask is, what will you do with yours? What, what will you do with your position of privilege? I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking to yourself, well, I, I don't have a position of privilege. I'm not in some big lofty position. I didn't get a, you know, promoted to some place where I've got all this influence. And I, I would argue with you, I'd say, yes, you do. Every single one of us in this place has been called to steward something. Jobs, uh, money, relationship, whatever it is, every single one of us, even if it's not been through your choice, maybe it wasn't something you wanted, or, but God has put you in a place where you have a voice, you have influence, you have relationship with other people, and, and you've been put there for such a time as this so that you can accomplish God's purposes with your life to point toward the person of Jesus. This is us. This is us. This is our lives. The question is, what are you gonna do? with your position of privilege and influence. When I was 22 years old, I was at the last part of uh, getting my ministry degree and I was doing an internship at a, at a large church. And basically this internship was like a supervised thing where I needed the good recommendation of the pastor of that church so that I could go on and get ordained and then go be a pastor. And so it was kind of the final hoop I had to jump through. And what, during my time while I was there at an in, as an intern at this church, um, this particular church had a daycare that functioned all during the week. There were families in the church that brought their kids and there was this daycare. Uh, but the problem was the daycare was bleeding. It was losing money left and right. And so everybody in the church knew there was tension between the board of elders and the daycare director. She had all these families, all these people who were coming, but it was losing all this money. And the board of elders had this really difficult decision to make. Like, what do we do? And so it was tense. And everybody knew there was not a great relationship there and things were tense. And so during my time there, what happened is the board of elders had a meeting behind closed doors and they came to the decision to... Uh, end the daycare, to close the daycare down. And so they had this plan to go and sit down, but before they could sit down eyeball to eyeball, face to face with the daycare director and explain their decision and talk about how are we gonna do this well so we handle this well together, somebody went to the daycare director and blew the whistle and, and gave the information and said, oh yeah, the, you know, the, the board of elders already decided to close this daycare and gave about half the information and some of the facts weren't completely straight and it blew up. I mean, it blew up. It was ugly. The daycare director gets furiously angry. Instead of talking to the board of elders, she starts talking to all the parents and all the people. The board of elders get angry and they kind of rally their troops and very quickly there's this, there's this two groups, this like line that goes right down the middle of the church and there are these two groups that are formed and everybody's being asked, which side are you on? Are you with the daycare people or are you with the board? And it was awful. And the board of elders started demanding to know, where did you get your information? They asked the daycare director, who told you about our decision? Who actually gave you this? Because some of the information is false. They demanded to know and she said, she refused. She said, I'm not gonna tell you where I got my information. I'm gonna protect my source. And what the daycare director knew and what the board of elders did not know and what I believe they still probably wouldn't know even to this day is that it was me. I was the leak. What happened was I knew the daycare director's son. He and I were really good friends. We had been in a band together in college. And so I was talking to a chatty staff member who happened to just know this decision was being made. And so armed with about half the information, I went and told the daycare director's son, I gossiped about it and just kind of, hey, did you hear? And he took it and told his mom and it just got blown up. 
Even in this lowly position I had as an intern, I used what little influence and little position I had, and I threw gas on this fire that was already there, and it just wrecked the church. And it killed me that this had happened. I felt sick about it. I mean, literally physically sick. I remember days, like while this whole thing was going, I would come into to the church to like do my responsibilities and, and stuff. And I would feel physically like I was gonna throw up. And I remember thinking to myself, thoughts like, you know, just keep your head down, keep your mouth shut, just do your job. And then, you know, wait for this thing to blow over. Take your recommendation from the pastor and just don't look back. Just get out of here and just put it behind you in your life. And then the Holy Spirit began to work on me and it began to speak to me. You ever have those situations where you're just like, oh God, will you just leave me alone? You ever experienced that? It was, it was like that. It, it was just like this every day. And the Holy Spirit just kept working on me and working on me until I, I kind of, I finally came to this realization where I realized the only way I was ever going to be able to make this right, the only way this was ever going to get healing was if this became real at a human level, as if I took this down to a more human personal level. And I knew what I had to do is I had to go into the office of the lead pastor and I needed to just confess and tell him it was me. I was the one that did this. She learned about it from me and, and just it confessed the whole thing and just asked for his forgiveness. And that's exactly what I did. I went into his office and it was terrible. You gotta understand, this guy could write a recommendation for me to go forward. He could stop me. He, he could have literally in that moment just said, you're done here. And then I would have had to have tried to find another internship somewhere else and hope that somebody would take me after something like that. And the most amazing thing happened when I did it. I confessed and at the end of it, I just said, will you forgive me? And to my shock, this lead pastor said, oh, that's how this whole thing happened? He said, that makes so much sense to me now. And he says, yes, I forgive you. And he extended grace to me that I did not deserve. And he said, will you help me make this right? And I said, of course. And so I ended up confessing to both groups of people what I'd done and just asking for their forgiveness. And what was amazing about that was when I asked for forgiveness, I sort of went first. It's like all the fuel for the fire just disappeared. And both these groups of people said, oh, okay. And they sat down together and they talked through an amicable way of, of kind of ending the daycare and moving forward. And the church recovered. And th that church to this day is still leading people to Jesus. And the reason I tell you that is because we sit here and we say, well, I don't have any position of privilege or influence. I don't have a voice. I don't have big decisions that I have to make. Yes, you do. Even as a, as a lowly intern, my words could throw gas on a fire and blow it up or my words could bring healing and point people to Jesus. So what are you gonna do with your position of influence? What kind of person are you gonna be? You're in relationships right now. You're in places in your life right now. Are you gonna be the type of person that throws gas on the fire and blows it up even bigger? Or are you gonna be the type of person who points people to the only one who can bring peace, ultimate peace, real peace into our world. It's Jesus. Are you gonna step in the gap for somebody and do that? So Lord Jesus, we just come before you this morning and we just recognize every single one of us has been given something to steward. Every single one of us has been put in a position. Maybe we didn't ask for it. Maybe we didn't want it. Maybe it came about through suffering and pain, but we have a story. We have a voice. So God, we don't doubt that you have put us in this moment for such a time as this, for your purposes. So God, would you show us how you want to heal us? It's by your wounds that we've been healed. Would you show us how to share that healing with the world we live in? Would you call us out of the comment sections where we want to fight and throw gas? And would you call us into the places in our world that are the most broken and most in desperately in need of the love of Jesus. Would you show us how to bring things in our world to a human level, to a personal level? Would you show us how to go first in asking for forgiveness and offering it? Jesus, we want to be your church, what you've called us to be. We want to see the rescue that you've done in our world, just keep reverberating out through your church. It's what we want to be a part of in our lives. I don't know why you choose to use us, God. 
I think about all the, the dumb stuff I've done. I can tell hundreds of these kinds of stories, and, and I, I don't know why you choose to use us, but it's amazing to me you do. You redeem us, you reconcile us, you forgive us, and then you call us to be your hands and your feet. What an amazing thing. So do it again, God. Do it through us. Do it in this time, in this generation. We ask in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.